Welcome back everybody, welcome back to the channel. So today we're going to be talking about how to actually uh, pre-process or post-process uh, methods. So if I go back to the compile function here, we're in the post-processing function. And if you guys remember, so we talked about how to pre-process generic classes or unprocessed classes. Um, and we passed in the unstable classes. Now, remember, you do want to create these two functions here because we're about to go over these uh, functions right now. So I don't think we're going to go over this one yet, but uh, definitely create these uh, resolve class uh, methods and resolve class mutations because we're basically going to be creating those in like the next two episodes. Um, so that way we don't have to go back through it. So what you want to do is create a resolve all methods function, and this function is going to be responsible for resolving every single method in our programming language. Now, we have our typical setup. We have our standard for loop. Uh, we get the current parser. We update the error management system. We get the log of the total amount of errors that we currently have. Uh, we add a scope. We put null in there for the class because it's going to be set down here. We for loop through the uh, every single AST in the current parser get that AST out as a branch and for the first AST it has to be a module declaration if it is then you know we get the module based off of parsing the module in that branch and then we locate the class of the global class pertaining to that actual module um, and we assign it here now this class is already going to be created because we already have code to create that so you guys should already have that available otherwise you know do the normal if it's undefined then create an undefined uh, class or find it because uh, this should already be created then we're going to have our standard switch statement. So we're going to switch for uh, AST class declaration, AST delegate declaration, method declarations, interface declarations, and mutate declarations. Finally, we're going to, just so we can get through this function, we're going to check our compiler errors to make sure we haven't blown over our limit after every time we process a function. Um, and then we want to check to see at the very end, outside of this for loop, uh, do we have any new errors? And if so, then we uh, basically add this current parser to the failed parsers. And we call add if. So if it's already there, then it won't be added again. Uh, then we just say remove scope. So we're going to remove whatever scope we created up here. And that's going to be it. So before we get down, because I mean, I'm pretty sure you guys kind of understand how the compiler kind of works so far. I basically have what I call the general method, which is the method that does the actual code for you know, doing whatever we need to process. So in this instance, we're processing uh, functions, but maybe in another instance, we're processing fields. So I have the general function, and then I have breakout functions. Basically, I have a class declaration, which just for loops through the class, and basically just calls the same function or a subset of that function. So first, let's just look at the basic way of how we process methods in the programming language. So again, this is the post-processing phase. Now, if you guys remember, we did not post-process functions in the beginning. So if I go back up to the compile, we only processed fields at the very beginning of our programming language, and we ignored methods. The reason why is because you want to do fields first because those are going to be the most likely things you're going to encounter, and you just want to do methods last because methods are a lot more complicated to process in a compiler. So what you want to do for global methods, so this is going to be the case where if I go here, it's going to be a case where if we have a global define foo, um, foo, and you know it doesn't matter the parameters, doesn't matter the return type. This is just a globally created function. So you want to create a uh, resolved global method declaration, and then you want to basically just get the resolved class. So what you want to try to do is get the extension function of this, uh, or get the extension function class from this function. So if you guys remember, if I wanted to add a, for instance, this is channel. I was doing some multi-threading uh, testing a little earlier, but basically a channel in short is a way for you to talk directly between threads. This is actually new. This is going to be in the API in the next version. Um, if you guys have ever worked with Kotlin before, this is exactly the same thing. Um, so it's just a channel that you use to talk to threads. But if we actually wanted to add a function to channel, we can say channel. Uh, C H A N N E L L, or it's just one L channel of var dot foo. So we're going to create a channel of whatever type and then say dot foo. Now this is going to be considered the extension class. Now we're going to see it in a second, but if there is no extension class, this will basically be null. So let's go here. 
So this function, get extension function class, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's not that crazy. It basically reuses all of the same functions that we've already talked about. So uh, it basically, uh, first what we do is we check to see if the current AST that we're passing in. So what we're going to pass in is the AST that was passed in here. We want to make sure that the AST that was passed in is in fact a method or a delegate declaration. If not, then we just return null. Now, the reason why this is just a safety check, uh, just to make sure we don't make a mistake. And a good rule of thumb is whenever possible, return null if you're going to be returning pointers, because you don't want to get weird undefined segmentation faults in your compiler. So if you access a null pointer, it's going to be pretty easy for you to figure out where that is in your C++ code. So I highly recommend that. Uh, but what we want to do is in order to process this extension function, so if I go back here, in order to process this channel of var uh, dot foo, so what we do is we basically uh, compile the reference pointer by passing in the pointer and then getting the AST reference pointer. Now I'm going to go back to the parser here for a second. So I'm going to go back to the front end parser and I'm going to go to, uh, what is it, parse uh, method. So if I go to parse method declaration, then you can see here that if we have an extension function, it's going to be a reference pointer first, and that's kind of what we need to process. So if I go back, uh, we already have this function, guys. We've already gone over this. This was uh, ran to in the very beginning, so you should already have a way to compile reference pointers. So I'm not going to go over this function. After that, you basically want to just check to see if the pointers module is equal to an empty string. If so, and the pointer classes is singular, then you want to return null. Basically what this means is that you are telling the user that this is going to be a function that does not have an extension class and it is not inside of a different module because I don't know if you guys knew, but you know how I have like this app here? This app module is a specific name that specifies this is the main function of where uh, we are in the code. Now the main function can be inside of any module, it doesn't really matter. But if I wanted to add a function to the standard library, instead of literally going into the support library and like modifying those files, I can literally just say std hashtag foo. Now this function, as far as the compiler is concerned, is inside of the standard library module in the same way as if I literally just cut this file and pasted it into the standard library. So that's why we want to check for both the hashtag and the class as well, just to make sure that we are absolutely sure that there is nothing going on. So after that, um, so if that's the case, we return null. Otherwise, if the module is not equal to null and the pointer classes is singular, meaning that if we have this example where if we have the std hashtag, the next class or the next thing that we need to process is going to be one element after the module. So that's why we're saying singular. And if so, then we basically want to just try to resolve the class we want to pass in the pointers module that we're trying to reference. And then we want to check to see if that is not equal to null. If so, we pass in that pointers module. Otherwise, we pass in the undefined module because maybe that module just doesn't exist. Um, and then you want to pass in the global class. Um, and this basically allows us to add this foo function to the uh, class underscore underscore SRT global. Uh, inside of the standard library or the standard uh, API. So this would be inside of the standard uh, SRT global class. Um, so once we do all of that, then we're ready to go. Um, otherwise, if you know neither of these are true, then what we do is we just say pointer classes pop back. We pop one value off of the list, and then we basically just try to resolve the class reference. Now this is used, this is the exact same function that was basically used when we were trying to uh, compile base classes. So if I go back here and I go to compile and then I go to preprocess and resolve base classes, resolve super class, resolve base class, we're literally calling the exact same function of resolve class reference here. So it's literally the same thing. So you guys can just reuse the same function. Again, remember, the goal of this compiler is to reuse as much code as possible. The only thing different here that I'm doing is I'm saying allow generics. And what that effectively does is now, as we're processing the classes, trying to figure out, you know, what class is what, if we allow generics and I basically find a generic class inside 
of our compiler, then I return that class. Otherwise, I say it was found to be a generic class. Have you missed the key parameters, perhaps? So the reason why we want to do this is because what if the user did, instead of doing like channel, C-H-A-N-N-E-L, of type var, what if the user, and you know, put the dot, what if they just put channel? That effectively means that now whatever type of channel class that you create, this function is going to be inside of all of them. So, and then of course you can, you know, be dynamic. So you'd have to actually go to the channel source code. So if I go here to the IO, and then I go to, where is it at? Channel.sharp. And then you can see here that it has a type of T. So then what we could do is then we could just say T um, of, you know, data or whatever, or actually that's backwards. We can say data of type T. And then we can, you know, do whatever we need to do on that data. And this is going to be completely dynamic based on whatever type we're creating at the time. So then later on, we can create, you know, or we could say chan dot foo, because obviously this foo function is going to reside in every single type of channel. Um, so you want to just make sure that you support that as well. It's a really nice way to not force the user to have to write so much code um, to just make it a little bit more generic. And once you do all that, then you're good to go. So once you basically compile or get the extension function class back, then I say here that our method is most likely just a normal global function. So we call resolve method, which we'll get to in a second. Now let's see how we actually handle processing extension functions. So the way I do it in my compiler to compile extension functions is I check to see if the resolve class and I check the flag and see if it's a stable class. If it's a stable class, then I say extension functions are not allowed on stable class, and I just say whatever the class is. Make sure you put the full name so that way the user knows exactly the name of the class. After that, you want to then basically do a couple of checks. So if the class is a generic class, right? So I'm going to get the resolved class in the class type. So if it's a generic class and the generic owner is equal to null, then what you want to do is that basically means that we don't have access to the class. So if you guys remember, generics have a generic owner. So in this case, channel does not have a generic owner because it is the top level class for the generic type of channel. But if we specifically said, you know, channel of var, then we would have a generic owner of channel. So that's how we know the difference. And if it is the top level most class, then what you want to do is you basically want to, where's the function? You want to say resolve class and you want to get the extension function tree and you want to add that to the extension function tree. And literally all an extension function tree is, is literally just a list of uh, ASTs. So these are basically going to be functions or we're going to be pointing to the AST that the function was defined at. So that way when we create our class of var or whatever, we can literally go back to this exact AST and just create the function for that specific type. Now, if we go back here, so now if we know what the generic owner is, right? So if the generic owner is not equal to null, that means that we are at the point where we have a direct type of the actual class. So we know that this is a built class of channel of var. So what we want to do is we literally just want to resolve the method. But instead, you notice here that I didn't pass in the resolved class. You want to pass in the resolved class in here as the class that we're going to use. Now let's actually go into the resolve method function to see how everything works. Now the way I do this is I check to see if it's an extension function by, yeah, I mean, this is really inefficient. Uh, to be honest, you can just check to see if current class is not equal to null. Um, just do that and that obviously would be the case. Um, but I'm doing this, so I'm going to leave it. I'm not going to change my code, but yeah, that's the more efficient way of doing it. Um, but once you've said whether or not, or you could also just pass a boolean in here as well. But once you've determined that this is an extension function, we're just going to save that. And we're going to process our access types for functions. Now, I don't think we've gone over function access types, so let's go over them quickly. So you want to pass in an address or a reference to the flags list. You want to pass in the AST of access type because that's what is coming from the parser. And then if I go into parse method access flags, we can literally just uh, go through each AST, add them uh, to our flags list here, and convert our string to an access flag. So it's going to come in as strings from the parser, and we call this string to access flags. We already have, we already talked about this function, um, so it literally just creates the physical string value to the actual uh, AST value or 
access flag value. So once you do that, then we want to, now the rules are a little bit different, right? So when it comes to functions, if the last flag uh, that we processed is a local flag and we're not, a, we're not at global scope, then I want to say illegal access specifier, uh, and then I say whatever the access flag is, can only be used at global scope. Basically meaning that you can't have a local function that is residing inside of a class. And if you guys didn't know, basically local functions, um, so if I do this, if I say local, if I create a local function here, that means that this foo function literally can only be called from inside of this file. Uh, typically, whenever you have functions, it's restricted to either the package it's in or the module, as well as if it's inside of an enclosing class of, you know, the foo class or whatever. Um, so just keep that in mind. So that's why I have that. Um, and then otherwise, if the last flag is equal to constant, or if the last flag is not equal to native, and it's greater than or equal to static, meaning that if it's, you know, stable, unstable, extension, um, and I did check to see if it's not equal to native, so if it's not this and it's one of these, basically, that's illegal. You literally can't have a stable function. That doesn't make any sense. So we just say error position is equal to I, and I jump to error, which is down here, which just prints out the illegal access specifier error, and it just passes in the illegal access specifier that broke. Now this does have a default message. I think it prints out um, by default um, illegal uh, access. I'm not gonna write it, but it, I think it prints out uh, illegal access specifier found, and then it prints out whatever the uh, extra messages that I put in here. So now going on, uh, if we keep moving on with this, uh, basically what we do is I do this check here. So if the flags uh, or if the first flag is less than or equal to local, meaning that if it's local, private, you know, public or whatever, then I have this order for functions. The next one has to be static. So if it's local, the next one after that, if it has another flag, has to be static. Um, otherwise, that's obviously a problem. So I check to see if the next one is static or native, right? So you can have a local native function, a public native function, or a public static. Um, otherwise, if it's equal to three, then you can have a local or public private protected static native, because of course you can have instance functions that are native. Uh, you basically just have to pass in the instance to that actual function when you call it. But yeah, so that's kind of the format. And we've already gone over this format before, guys. Like, you know how it works. It's pretty simple. Um, I just literally check to see if the flag at a certain index is equal to another flag. If not, I set the error position at that index. I go to error. I print out the error. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, if we have static, then the thing after that has to follow a native. Otherwise, if the flag is native, we literally cannot have anything afterwards. Otherwise, we, you know, set the error position and we just go to error. And that's it. So that's literally everything. Otherwise, if it's neither of these, then obviously we just immediately jump to the error position uh, or we jump to the error uh, block of code. And that's it. Now let's actually go back to resolve method. So go back to resolve method. Now that we have our uh, access types processed, now we want to check to see if the function has a public, private, or protected. If it doesn't have any of those, I default functions to a public status. Uh, you guys can pick whatever you want in your programming language. If you want to default to private, you can. It's up to you. Now, if it is a global scope and it's not an extension function, I do add the static flag because, I mean, it's a global scope, right? So it's not tied to any one class. So by default, this is going to be a static function. And I slap that on by default. So that way the user doesn't have to type this code. It's obviously a static function. So, you know, that's just one thing that I do to make it easier for the user. Now, if we're at global scope and it's not an extension function, uh, so if we don't have any access flags, so this is the case where if we literally don't have anything, we just have like a standard function where we just say define the function name, um, then, and it has to not be an extension function as well. Uh, if we're at global scope, I say it's a public static function. Otherwise, then I just say it's a public function, and that's pretty much it. So now let's go down here. So next, we want to set up the parameters. So we want to compile the reference pointer again. So we want to get the reference pointer. This is going to represent the name of the function. So we want to pull off the last pointer or the last value in the classes list from our reference pointer. That's going to represent the actual name of the function. So even if this is an extension function of uh, channel, 
then we can still access the last value in the list. Uh, so once we do that, then we, uh, if the current class is equal to null, right? So if you guys remember, if it is a global function and it's not an extension function, the uh, current class that we pass in is going to be null here. So we want to set the current class equal to the current scopes class. Um, and then what we do is we do what's called parsing a uType arg list. Now what this is going to do is this is literally going to go through and parse all the arguments inside the function. So I don't think this one's actually that complicated, so let's just go through it. So first we pass it a list of parameters, which are going to be a list of fields, and then we uh, pass it the ASTU type arg list. Once we do that, uh, then we have our params here uh, in our AST, so we for loop through the entire AST's sub AST count, and we do what's called compiling a uType arg. So we pull off an AST from the branch at the index of i, and to compile a uType argument inside of a function, now this actually isn't compiling it. What we're actually doing is we're building out the skeleton or the blueprint of this actual field. We're not actually doing much processing right now. So I have multiple stages of processing fields. We'll see how that works later. Um, basically, you create a field of an argument. Um, I set the GUID equal to GUID, and I don't plus plus the value uh, yet. So uh, I also set the module of this field equal to the current module. You want to set up this preliminary data just in case you use it later on in the compiler. Set up the metadata. Guys, this is literally just copy and pasted. I'm not going to go through this. I've gone through this several times. Basically, anywhere where you have a metadata correction, I literally just copy and paste the same crap. So there's nothing different here. Um, I basically just am pulling data from the um, from the current parser and the tokenizer just to get whatever metadata I need based on the line and column that this AST was found on. Uh, so once we do that, then we want to uh, copy that metadata. And then, okay, so it looks like I have a bug here. So I'm going to say GUID++. So I want to increment the GUID. Now, here's why I don't do it. So for the option where we have the uh, name of the argument, now this is only going to work for uh, types of functions where we have function pointers. So if you guys have ever created a function pointer in the language, you know you can create arguments without names, right? Because you don't, it's not required. It's just a function pointer. Uh, or you could say, you know, args of type uh, object array and, you know, do something like that. Now, in the case where the user did not include the name of the argument, you want to create a dynamic argument because you don't want to make a mistake. Like, what if, you know, they didn't provide the name here, but then they said args here, and let's say, I don't know, this was a int array or something, right? So you don't want to collide the compiler with the user where you accidentally create a weird name. So the way I do this is if uh, the AST token count is not equal to zero, that means we do have an argument name. I pull that straight off the AST and set the name. And then I set the full name equal to the arg name as well. Um, and of course, I plus plus GUID. Now, in the case where we don't have a name, what I do is I create a dynamic argument by saying argument and GUID plus plus. Now, if you guys remember, GUID is a completely unique number value and it's completely random. So every time you compile the programming language, the starting value of this integer is going to be different. So this guarantees that basically every time when you create an argument, it will never be the same. It doesn't matter how many arguments the user tries to create in the programming language. Now, there is theoretically a potential that the user can say arg0 and the compiler will collide at one point with that but it's highly unlikely. So once we go back, so once you do that, and you also want to set the full name to the name as well, then it's time to actually resolve the field type. Now this part is pretty complex, and this involves us compiling uTypes, which we don't have enough time for that in today's episode. Compiling uTypes is a huge monster of a function, and we'll just go over this at a later date. So, but this is basically how I compile types in the entire programming language. That's a massive function, so that's going to probably be done over like several episodes. But what you want to do is you want to do what's called retain type inference. I will briefly explain how this works, and I'll talk about, you know, obviously you want to create these functions, um, but let's just kind of go through it. So in my programming language, I have a concept called type inference mode. And this type inference flag, it's going to be a Boolean that's going to be inside of my compiler, 
where I basically want to say whether or not we're in type inference mode. And what that means is that if I call resolve uType, that means that I'm telling the compiler I want to resolve a type of data to the you know right side of something, right? So if I want to try to figure out the type of task count, I want to try to resolve the type of this 64 to see what's actually going on. Now, if I want to process this type, I am going to need to have what's called a L value or a literal value of something, right? So if I say, um, you know, task count is equal to Chan, this is something that can literally evaluate to a value, right? Or if I say like 64, totally fine. But if I say something like var, this does not evaluate to a value because it is not an actual evaluable type. So I know this is weird, but basically if we're in type inference mode, you can only have types that evaluate to values. If we're not in type inference mode, you can have both things that evaluate to types and things that don't evaluate to types. So I hope I didn't confuse anyone. Basically just set this value to true and you wanna create your uh, retain and restore uh, define statements for this because we're gonna be using this actually a lot in the compiler. So we basically just save the old state of type inference, set the new state, and then to restore it, we just set it by setting the old state. Uh, once you do that, you wanna create a function called compile field type. We will go over this function uh, a little later. You basically pass in a field and a uType that we're trying to assign to this field, and then an AST as well for error reporting purposes. And the purpose of this function is basically just to check the type to make sure that it is a literal type. So if we have, for instance, type inference mode enabled, then it's gonna have to evaluate to something. Otherwise, we're gonna you know, complain right here. So once we do that, you also wanna create a function called compile uType. We're gonna go over this later on, but it's gonna return a uType pointer. And we wanna pass in an AST and then whether or not we've captured the instance. And just add this, this is used for like uh, instance tracking whenever you're like, you know, doing dot notation. So, so if I say like oh, some class dot some field dot data or something like that, then when I come in to process the first type of some class, I do not have, or I have not yet captured the instance of whatever that type is. So that's what this is for. Once we get to some field, I've captured the instance. And as I'm processing this type, I no longer need to pull that instance from somewhere. Again, another complicated thing, but we'll go over that later on. Uh, then finally, you just return arg. So once you do all of that, I wanna go back to resolve method. And once you do that, then we're basically ready to validate the method parameters. So just because we process these parameters does not mean we're okay. Uh, we want to validate them basically to check for duplicates. So, you know, what if you create a function, right? And let's say this function, uh, let's say we have two arg2s in the actual programming language. Well, you, that's not possible, right? You can't have two parameters with the same name. So we want to make sure that that's not the case. Uh, so we pass it the AST uType arg list again, and we literally just for loop through the entire parameters, and we use this AST for error reporting purposes. And we check to see if we contain a parameter based on the name that we passed in here. So this contains param function. We're going to pass it the parameters and then the name of the parameter at the whatever index that we're at. And this is literally just going to for loop through the entire parameters list and compare all the names of every single parameter to the name that we passed in here. And we're going to increase the uh, param count. And we're going to use a param count variable uh, to basically check for it. So obviously, as we're processing this, so as you can see here, uh, we're checking to see if we have duplicates. You're obviously going to have at least one case of that parameter, right? So if we run into that one case of that parameter's name, then we're going to just increment it. But if we run into a second case of that parameter of x, then obviously that's a problem. So if the param count is greater than one, that means there's two of them. We return true stating that we found a duplicate of this parameter. So once you do that, then um, that's good. So if we have a duplicate, then we'll say uh, symbol already defined, and we'll say uh, parameter, whatever, already defined in scope. Um, and then after that, I literally just set the params address. So if it is not defined, I dynamically set the parameters address equal to whatever it is in the index. So this is how I set addresses of fields. We're seeing an actual live example of how this happens. So whenever you say, I don't know, uh, data is equal to, and then let's say, you know, we assign it to some function, 
right? And we have this sum function defined somewhere else in code. Then we're going to have to know what the address of this field is, and we use that by figuring it out here. Uh, once we do that, then we want to check to see if the parameter's name is equal to a blank, which it shouldn't be. I think this is leftover code, um, but just in case, I check to see if this is in U type arg list optional. If so, then I say arg is equal to i, so I say arg and i. And then I say name, you know, whatever the name is, and then full name, and that's pretty much it. So I don't think this is code that actually gets run. I think this is leftover code, but I'm just explaining everything just to be uh, comprehensive. So once we validate the parameters, then we're ready to set up our metadata. Same stuff as usual, same code, just copy and paste it. Um, you want to create a method pointer, and in there you want to pass it a bunch of crap. So um, I have this method uh, function here that's a constructor. And we literally just pass in whatever basic data we need, like the name of the function, what module it's defined in, who owns the function, its GUID, what parameters does it have, any access flags, as well as metadata. Literally everything else you just assign it to its default value. You can pick whatever default values you want for your stuff. Um, but yeah, so I have all of this here. And make sure you set the type of this as a method in the data entity. Uh, so each data entity, remember, has a type field. So just make sure you do that in your constructor so you'll be good. Um, and then, you know, initialize any other pieces of data that you have. Now, here's something special that I do. So if the flag, so as I'm creating a function, if the flags is not static, right? So if we cannot find the static flag, that means that this is what's called an instance function. So what I do is I modify the data, uh, the code data, uh, data structure in the actual method and I increase the local variable size. And what that does is I basically increase it to one. The reason why you wanna do this is because as we come to accessing these fields, we're gonna be using this variable later on to actually track the addresses of every single field in the function. And you wanna allocate one slot for the instance of the class. Because if you remember, instance of zero is always pointing to the instance of the current class. So we just want to do that. We'll see where this is used later on. Uh, it's going to be way down the line. Uh, once you create this uh, function here, you want to pass in all of your data. So, you know, everything that I just mentioned. And then you want to pass it. So here's how I set the full name. I get the current class that the function is supposed to be residing in. I get the full name of that. And then I say dot and then the name of the function. So that way, if, you know, for instance, here, we have this foo function, the full name of this foo function, or what I call the fully qualified name. It's going to be app hashtag underscore SRT global dot foo. So this is going to be what's called the fully qualified name of that actual function. So, you know, that's what I do. And once we do that, then um, I set up the AST. I set the address equal to method size. So basically every time I create a function, I just increase this field. Uh, this is going to be the direct address for accessing and calling this function. Uh, so once we do that, then we want to check to see if the type is equal to a delegate declaration. And if so, then we want to do some checks. Otherwise, we want to do some other checks. So if this is a delegate declaration, then basically you want to check to see if the uh, method has a static flag. And if it is not a native function, then you want to say delegate functions are not allowed at global scope. Now. I think that's probably a bad name. I probably should just say global scopes are not allowed to be static. Um, so I'm going to actually change this to have static. So that's better for actually reporting the error. You can have static delegates. This is just a rule in my programming language uh, that does not allow you to have static delegates. So yeah, that's what I have. Um, now, if the function is in fact a native function and the class that owns the function is an interface, then I say native functions are not allowed in interfaces. I do not allow native functions to be called inside of interfaces because they're not delegates. Delegate functions are used to act on a specific instance in a specific way, and native functions just do not act in the same way that delegate functions do. So again, this is just another rule in my programming language. Now, if the method is in fact a native function, then I say native code found equal to true. And this is gonna be a Boolean that I'm gonna check at the end of the compilation process and in the case where we have native code found, I'm basically going to generate a folder called generated or whatever the user passed in. And I'm basically going to generate all of this C++ code. So if we have not found any native code, then there's no point in me generating this. 
So instead of me basically traversing the entire functions tree to try to figure out if every single function has the native flag, I use that simple Boolean to basically set this to true so that way we just know to do that. Uh, finally, you want to set your uh, function type to function delegate. So I have a couple different function types here. I'm going to have normal, constructor, pointer, lambdas, overrides, delegates, and undefined. So since this is considered a delegate function, you want to set it to that. Now, if it is not, uh, if the current AST is not a delegate declaration and we have a native function, I can say native functions cannot be implemented, uh, try, define, native, whatever. So this is literally me showing an exact code example in the error management system to the user. So I'm literally saying you can't have a native uh, defined foo with a function body because that doesn't make any sense. You're supposed to be offloading this work to some C++ function later on. So that's another error that I have. And then once you do that, um, I basically just set the function as a normal function. And then I do a couple more checks. So I check to see if the method's address is greater than or equal to the function limit. Now the current limit for functions that I have is, what is it, 8.3 million. So currently you can only have as much as 8.3 million total functions in the entire programming language. I think that's enough, so you know that's my limit. And then uh, basically I say maximum function limit of you know whatever reached. And again, guys, remember I got this limit and calculated this by just analyzing all instructions that deal with functions. And it's just simple math, right? You just pick the lowest sized instruction or the instruction that basically has the lowest uh, parameters or the lowest value as its max value. And then that's going to be your limit for that function because you can't go over that max value. Um, so that's kind of how I do it. It's going to be completely dependent on your system. So you'll have to figure that out on your own. Uh, but once you do that, then you set uh, whether or not this is an extension function from this Boolean up top that we set up. Then after that, um, I compile the method return type. Now again, this is going to be another function that we're going to have to go over later because this involves processing expressions, which is going to take a huge amount of time. So I can't go over this either. So I apologize for continuing to tell you guys to just create functions and having all these empty function bodies. It's really complicated. You know, we'll go over it at some point. Uh, but in order to compile a method return type, I would definitely recommend creating this function. Uh, you want to pass in the current function that we're compiling, the AST that the function was defined at, and then whether or not we want to wait to compile. So literally wait means, you know, don't compile it yet. So that's what it does. Um, so make sure you do that. And once we have that function, assuming we have that function created, it doesn't have to work. Um, then you want to try to add the function to the programming language. So when it comes to creating and adding functions, you don't want the user to have duplicates, right? So if I have two foo functions and they're the same function that takes the same you know, field that is basically a function pointer that has the exact same uh, type, you don't want that to happen. So in order to protect against that, I basically have this function called add function. And the way it works is we pass in the current class that we're trying to add the function to, the actual reference to the method, and the uh, resolution function. So the resolution function is basically going to be the function pointer that's going to tell the compiler how to resolve this function. So we're going to do what's called a simple parameter match. And literally what a simple parameter match does is it does a direct comparison of each type. So let's make something a little simpler here. So let's say I have data of var and then, I don't know, size of int, right? Then let's say I have data of var, then size of, I don't know, long, right? So if I have two completely different types, it's going to say, all right, uh, these two functions here, all right, data and data, are they both vars? All right, good, those are the same. Size and size, are they both longs? No, one's a long, one's an int. So since this is a simple parameter match, by definition, these two functions are two completely separate functions. And basically, they're known as what I call, and this is the actual technical term, overloaded, overloaded functions. Meaning that you can have the same function with the same name, but taking different parameters or arguments, and it overloads the value on the previous declaration. So, and we'll get to see how this is actually resolved later on. It's kind of cool how I do it. 
But in order to do a simple parameter match, first, obviously, the parameters have to be the same size. If we have two functions, it doesn't matter if the name is the same. If we have, I don't know, x of var, right? Now, this has a total of three parameters. Obviously, these aren't the same functions, even if the types are literally exactly the same because there's more parameters on one function than the other. And this is, again, still considered an overloaded function. So it doesn't matter. An overloaded function is classified as any functions with the same name but different arguments. So that's what that is. And what I do is I for loop through all the parameters, and we literally just call equals. So we talked about this a while ago, and we kind of went over how to set up a field object. So you guys can check that out. Um, I'm going to leave that in the video below. If you want to check that out but i basically explain how i compare u types in the programming language so once we do that uh, once we have this function created um, we're going to check to see if they're not equal if any of the parameters inside of the parameters list is not equal to one another we return false otherwise we return true otherwise that the parameters are not equal to each other we return false so that's kind of how it works i also have a complex parameter match as well We'll get into that later. That's that's a little bit of a special function. Um, so let's see. So if I go back to the actual function here. So now that we have our resolution function created, we have this add function function here, and we want to create a field of you know the actual function type of our resolution function. And then I call a function on the class called get all functions by name. I pass the name of the method, and then I pass it the functions list. And that literally just goes through the entire class and every single function. And if the name matches, we add it to the list. And then I have this Boolean here, whether or not we need to check the base class. By default, it is set to false. Um, but I basically check the base class if it's set to true. Then I check to also make sure we have a super class to call on. After that, I return uh, whether or not we have processed all the functions by the name and the super class. And basically, once it bubbles up to the last uh, class that it's going to process, I return whether or not we found anything by whether or not the functions list that we passed in here is empty. So that's kind of how I do it. Um, so once I go back, let's see. So when it comes to resolving or adding a function, uh, it's pretty simple. So you just check to see if the functions list is not empty. We want to make sure that we don't have this function already defined. Now, I know you probably noticed something here. I'm only checking the parameters. I'm not checking the return type. The return type doesn't matter. It's all about the parameters when it comes to function overloading. So you literally can't have functions with the same parameters. Uh, so it's all about the function parameters. Uh, so we call our function resolution uh, pointer here. We pass it the parameters of each function. And we just for loop through the entire functions list. And that's it. Now, if we cannot add the function, we basically free up the list before we return out and we return false because that means that we have two of the same functions with alike parameters. Otherwise, if we don't get there, whether the functions list is empty or we don't have any parameters that match, we just add the function to the class, which literally just adds the function pointer to the functions list. So once that's done, then we're ready to basically uh, free up the functions list that we had up here and return true. Now, if we get a false value from the add functions, that's obviously a problem. That means that we could not add this function and it was already defined somewhere else. So what we do is we say, you know, previously defined function whatever is already defined in the scope. And then basically what I do is I try to find that function by passing it the current class, the method, and the, again, function resolution of a simple parameter match. And then I access the metadata of that function. Now it's safe to just access the pointer directly because we know it exists. Um, and then I say function whatever is previously defined here. And the way that I find the function is it's pretty simple. So I it's, it's literally like the same function that we did uh, that I just showed you guys. Um, so I create a functions list. And, and then I basically just check to see if the class that we pass in has a generic owner. If so, then I basically check to see if the current class, uh, their processed extension functions is less than the generic owner's extension function tree's size, then I basically resolve all extension functions. Now, this method is basically how the magic happens, right? So if I create a channel, right? So if I go back up here to the example where I have a channel, foo, basically the way these generic classes work is here's the magic behind it. They work on a as is or need to know basis, right? So if I did not call this function foo previously, 
It does not make sense to create the function and waste processing power. You want to wait till as late as possible to process the function. Now it will eventually get processed. Even if we don't call on this foo function, the compiler will eventually just say, okay, finally I will process the function. But if we do it before then, then you know we just do it before then. So basically what we do to resolve the extension functions is we literally just create this resolve extension functions class. We pass in an unprocessed class and we want to make sure that we have a generic owner, meaning that this is in fact the created generic class. So it's not like channel, like the original generic class. We want it to be channel of type var, right? So that we know that this is an actual created generic class. Once we do that, we add a scope of unprocessed class, and then we uh, basically set up our extension function tree. So we get our extension function tree from the actual generic owners class, and then we retain type inference. We set that to false, um, then we restore it afterwards, and we literally just for loop through the unprocessed uh, or the processed extension functions. Now, if you notice, I set i equal to the processed extension functions because we don't want to process any extension functions that were already processed underneath that dynamic class. So we only want to start from the point on forward for functions that we haven't processed. Um, then we go for the total amount of extension functions and we literally just say, you know, resolve method, which is the function that we're talking about now. And we're passing in the extension function that we need to resolve, then the uh, current class, which is the unprocessed class that the function is going to be residing inside of. So if you remember, if the uh, current class is equal to null, that's only when it's going to set this value from the current scope of whatever the class is. Um, so if we pass in the class that we want to put the function inside of, it's going to use that class instead. Um, and then finally, we you know obviously say unprocessed class and we increment the uh, processed extension functions variable. Uh, then after that, we remove the scope and we return true, and that's it. So that's how you process extension functions inside of a generic class. Um, so now let's go back. Uh, so as we're finding this function, once we resolve all extension functions, then we say, you know, get all functions by name, and we basically pass it the method name and then the functions list. This is the same function we just talked about. Um, and then we do the same crap. We literally just, you know, for loop through the functions list. We call the function resolution uh, pointer. If we find a function that matches the parameters based on the function resolution, uh, pointer that we passed in, then I basically pull that function off the list, free up the functions uh, list here, and then return that address. Otherwise, I free up the functions at the end and return null. So finally, now that we have been able to find the function that we want to locate, we basically just say, you know, that function's metadata, and then function previously defined here. So now when it comes to printing notes in the compiler, I'm actually going to try to print an example here. So if I go to the syntax and I go to channel, I'm actually going to break my standard library really quick. If you guys have ever seen in C++ when you have like an error, it says note previously defined here or note something else. You're basically just trying to tell the user, take note, this is something you might want to pay attention to. So the way that notes work is I want to make sure that we haven't printed this note already. So did I actually make a compiler error? Yeah, okay. Um, data of type t is equal to null. I know that you can't assign null to a var, so that's good enough. Um, but let's go back. So if we have not printed the last note message equal to the message that we're trying to print, and if the last note's message that we mentioned is not equal to the metadata's line, and we cannot find that note message, then we want to print out the data of that note. Now, if you can see here, here's a perfect example of why we may want to do this. So as our compiler is compiling all this code, we literally create a dynamic class of channel here. And what happens is we basically get the error. So we say error, incompatible types, you know, cannot convert object to, you know, uh, local data. And we're basically saying we can't assign this value here. The important thing is that I'm saying my note here, where I'm saying note in generic channel of type var. And then I specifically point to the point at which you know this happens so now if i say int right and int is an actual class it's not a native type so i can then just hit play to try to recompile this and i won't get the note message again because basically int is able to be set to null 
So if we go down here, we can see that zero errors because we can actually set that value to null. So that's how it works. Um, it's pretty good for helping out the user. So let's see what happens. So I basically just say in file, I say the name of the file, colon, the line, colon, the column, colon, and then note. And you want to do it in this format, by the way, because if I go back to um, pressing play here, and I try to basically compile this code again, you're going to notice something down here. If I try to, or when the actual message gets printed, I can actually select where the error actually happened. You can see here that there's a, okay, well, it didn't show up. Oh, because I removed the code. That's fine. Basically, it's going to come in this format. You want to do it in this format because certain IDEs support formatting of printing out data into the console at this format. And if you select it, you can then select the error or the warning of whatever's happening, and it'll take you directly to that file and that line. So if I close this list, if I double tap it, it takes me here, and it points directly to the line in question that the compiler's talking about. So that's very nice. You want to make sure you do it in that order. Then you say note whatever the message is. You end the line. You put a bunch of tabs. You say, you know, here's the actual line. So we're putting the actual line of the data. And then here's how I basically put the error at which, you know, something happened. Um, so in this case, this is a warning that I'm getting from my standard library saying redundant cast of type var array to var array. And I'm basically trying to cast this function of copy to a var array and it's getting that warning as soon as I try to assign this value to the data field so you want to put the error at the exact point at which something happened so the way I do that is after printing the line I basically for loop through all the way up to one point before the column and I'm putting a bunch of spaces and then the final point in the column you want to put the space you don't want to go up to the column because then you'll basically be putting this after the fact so you'll be pointing to this right here instead of the actual, you know, equal sign. Uh, then finally, you want to see out the uh, the notes string. So this is basically the string string that we're building up here. And then you want to set the last note message and you want to add this to the notes list. And once you do that, that's it. Um, so that's how you print notes uh, to basically let the user know that they screwed up. Um, and then once you do that, let's see, so if I go back, I bounced around a bunch. Once you print out that note, then you're ready to uh, free up the method because obviously, you allocated data here so you want to free it up and then you delete the method uh, and that's it now if we did successfully add it all I do is check to see if the method is a native method if so then I add it to the unprocessed methods list there's a reason for this we'll see uh, why I do that later on but that's pretty much it guys so that's how you pre-process methods in the programming language now I did not go over everything so in the next video on Friday um, C O M P I L E. We're going to go over finishing up how to pre process uh, or post process methods in the programming language by going into all of these other functions as well. And they're basically going to pretty much reuse the same technology that we just talked about. So we'll talk about that later on. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. As usual, if you have any questions, definitely put them in the comment section below. And of course, if you guys would love to help support the channel, you can always head over to the GitHub repository at slash sharp. When you do, definitely watch Star and Fork this repository. That gives this language a lot more visibility and let other developers know this language exists. Also, if you guys are curious about some of the stuff that I'm doing in the future or stuff that I'm working on in present time, uh, you can head over to the roadmap section. And this is pretty much a live view as to what I'm doing with the programming language in real time. So that's going to be it for today, guys. As usual, if you're new to the channel, definitely consider subscribing. And until next time, see you guys later. Thank you